Hello, it's John Baptiste here in my office at the Ed Sullivan Theater, and I'm sitting in the midst of one of the greatest American musicians in the history of music, saxophonist, and also having a tenure in Miles Davis's great quintet, the great Wayne Shorter. It's a beautiful, beautiful pleasure and honor to have you seated here today. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be sitting with you and uh, part of the family, uh, more than a tradition of uh, following through with the, 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 you know, your heart in the, in, the, in the world of music and the world uh, at large. Oh, absolutely. Beyond just uh, like, like, uh, like when Miles said, uh, somebody asked him about playing music and Miles, he, he got tired of hearing him talking about music. He said, I am not, he said, I am, I am not what I do. Mm. I do what I am. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he got years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, can, can you play the Saints? <laughs> well, you, you also, you know, after, after you played with Miles, you had some bands of your own. You played with Art Blakey. You played with Weather Report. And that was also a project of your own. Oh, yeah. you, you changed with the times in yeah. your music. I mean, everybody still plays it. How does that make you feel looking back? And you're still writing more music. You came in today and you told me you were writing a clarinet concerto. So yeah. how, does, how does that feel? This, this is like, uh, I, I'm saying, when does it, the, this uh, wake up in the morning? Yeah. I got to I got to uh -huh. it, it doesn't go away. It, um, it, it's, it's a sense of kind of a mission. Mm -hmm. And look, that, the thing about uh, a mission. Ah, two, great, two great things being born and the other one is knowing why. And, and knowing why is... All upon me now, because <laughs> I'm 82. You better not start getting to know why. Do you do you feel like this? You know, if you look at the root of the word vocation, and and that's actually not a secular word. As it's a calling, someone who has a vocation has a calling. Mm -hmm. And um, you, do you feel like there's a spiritual or supernatural connotation to your life in music that called you into it? Yes, Rather, I think because uh -huh. because uh, I I had no uh, desire or thought to, to play music until I was about 16. Mm, I started playing really? music when I was about 16. I got a clarinet at 16 and I took my first uh, lessons on a clarinet for one year. You know, wow. how to read, count time right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Did, and, and, and when did you know that you wanted to continue to pursue that? It's when I did, took my first uh, test in music theory and I got up before everybody finished the test and I thought I was making a lot of mistakes because once you get up, you got, you got to bring your paper to right. the desk. I brought it to the desk and before I left, she was looking at the paper and I was going to leave the room and she said, just a minute, class. And she held the paper up because they, they couldn't see my answers. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is a perfect test paper. And, so, and those other kids have been studying music since they were six, seven-year mm -hmm. piano, whatever. I'm not saying she wasn't trying to, you know, but as I walked down the hall, I was about 16 years old. I was uh -huh. walking down the hall, going to my next class. This, you know, like they say, this life-changing. Right. I'm thinking back now. It's yeah. like something like I'm getting a soundtrack of it. Like, like a heat, heat and cold came over. Me. Said, yeah. It's like. Eye opening, like wow. looking into yourself. It's, it's you know, a page turn. Yeah, it's something. Something happened. Another chapter mm -hmm. began. It, that that's something that you feel. I, I remember when I first really got into music. That's what I felt. I don't know how to explain it, but it's a it's a sensation that you can't do anything else. Yeah, you don't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And when you perform for audiences. What, are you trying to relate to them that feeling? What are you, what's your intent? Well, actually, the intent now is to um, uh, throw away and kind of put away everything that was learned, the, the studied stuff. Uh, again, I always refer, because Miles is the only one that would talk like this. He'd say, Wayne, he, he said, hey, Wayne, do you ever feel like you want to play? Uh, he said, you want to play like you don't know how to play? <laughs> and then he said, do you feel like you'd like to play music 
that doesn't sound like music. That doesn't sound, I know it's like right. familiar. And I have a tape of Charlie Parker giving a lesson and the, the, the student says, Mr. Parker, I have to learn all these scales, I have to all, memorize all these scales. And, and Bird said, yes, and after you finish, and you finish learning them, forget them. Right, play as if you don't know all of that stuff, or you're not playing a scale, mm -hmm. but you're playing straight from the heart. Yeah. That's beautiful. And this is the, where the classical people are starting, you know, kids, they, they're playing music that's written by someone else, and sometimes they get a question and say, okay, you, great, you know, magnificent. How do you feel? <laughs> what do you mean? Because they, they are feeling, as much as they serving the composer, you know, mm -hmm. the notes. Right. It's a, Tell me what you feel. Can you play something how you feel? Oh, I don't improvise. I don't know. That's the beauty of jazz. But now the, 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 the classical mind. They're minded, embracing that improvisation. That's why they say saying jazzical now. Uh -huh. <laughs> Class jazz. <laughs> I like that. In music form, how would you express who you are? If, if someone were to say, I'm from another planet and I only understand notes and tones, how would you play who you are? How would you play that? I only understand notes and tones? If you say you only understand notes and tones, um, somebody asked Tony Williams, this is an inverted one, asked mm -hmm. Tony Williams, what are you thinking about when you play the drums? Right. You know, Tony. Yeah, yeah Tony. What are you thinking about when you play? And Tony said, if I could tell you what I was thinking about, I wouldn't have to play. So that's him expressing who he is. Yeah. That's what he's thinking he said, about. He said, if I, if I could tell you what I was thinking about, I wouldn't have to play the drums. Uh, he can't express it in words. No. There's, there's a, a, like, how about the question, what is life? Mm. He says, what is life? And some wise guy said, what is life? What do you mean? He said, what is life? What, what is life? What? Who's on first? Who's <laughs> <laughs> what is life? And we're doing what every day. That's we're opening what up what is. Mm. That's, the, that's the kind of stuff that Alvin would talk about sometimes. <laughs> Man. Alvin He's Batiste, a man, that's a bad yeah. cat. That's yeah. my great, great mentor and family member. I heard he played like that. I said, I know he's in there. Yeah, he was very deeply philosophical and, mm -hmm. and very accomplished in yeah. his originality on his instrument. Yeah. What kind of stuff would y'all talk about? No, we, we only talk, spoke at, at Lent, like really quickly. Yes. Um, he, was, he was busy. Yes. He, was, he was a big group one time, and I was in the audience, and it was a not the Grammys, there was something going on. Uh -huh. Hey, how you doing? That yeah. kind of thing. What changed in the music to make things not as prevalent culturally for jazz? Well, you know, I think when bebop came along, it was a social movement too. You know, Charlie. Oh, Martin. definitely. It was a social movement. But then um, the, the trailblazing uh, pioneer spirit it's not dead. It's not dead, but it's still there. And I see it coming up in the faces and the eyes and in the, in the, in the, in the words of a lot of young people from mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's become global. Yes, yeah, South Korea. That's Japan. right. To close, I, I want to ask you what lessons you think a life of improvisation has taught you that you could relate to somebody who's a banker or an accountant or anybody outside of music. With the main thing I learned with improvisation is there's no such thing as a mistake. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, and there's no such thing as an interruption. An interruption when somebody can play, and you, you cut across one of them. No, yes. it, it's an opportunity. What was an interruption is now an opportunity, so, which all uh, helps to create trust. And how do we deal with the ego? Mm. 
Mm. I think uh, our ego should serve us instead of serving it. We have to learn how to have it serve us. Thank <laughs> you.